Good morning, Southside Bible Church. We join our hearts together then as one. I can't begin to tell you how much uh, I miss you. It was so good just seeing uh, the groups here this morning just lifted my heart, and I just appreciate the gathered church probably more than ever. It's such a means of grace to my own heart. I can't wait for that first Sunday when we're going to be back together uh, worshiping. Uh, this is this dis- distance, distancing, distancing stuff. It's just not in my DNA. When it's like a kid going to the candy store saying, do not touch, to not hug the saints. This has been very, very hard. So I, wanna, I want us to journey together. I want to welcome anyone who's joined us that doesn't normally attend Southside. We're glad uh, that you've come into our live stream this morning. <clears throat> I was out of town last Sunday, so I personally wanted to address us as a flock. What are, what, what are we currently facing with this coronavirus and what further challenges might come down our way. So we're going to pull out of Romans this morning, and then next week we're going to begin in chapter 2 of Romans. So I've entitled my study through Romans. You you probably have heard me, but I called it the revival of 2020, and I did not see this coming, uh, this coronavirus, and I pray that God would revive our souls worldwide why they're pondering the things that this whole world system has been designed to get you to ignore, like the fact that everybody's going to die and your soul's going to live forever. And what I would like to look at with you this morning is Philippians chapter 1, if you will turn there. Philippians chapter 1, verses 20 through 21. Verse 21 is my life verse. The reason I'm going there is after much thought and prayer, There's just so many things to talk about at a time like this, a lot of different angles, but I just, I like to run to the root as fast as I can. And our root fear, the one that all others spring from, and then uh, I I wanted to stare right in the face of the remedy this morning. So I want to learn from the Apostle Paul, and this letter, he's sitting in a prison cell. This is Paul's first Roman imprisonment, and he's awaiting a sentence And the sentence is going to be life or death, whether his head is going to be cut off or whether Paul is going to be released from the prison, the charge for preaching the gospel and stirring up strife. He's solely dependent upon others for food, clothing, shelter. So there's probably enough similarity as we face a virus that is killing people and has been titled a pandemic. We're facing immediately loss of jobs, problems getting food and supplies, and the potential of an economic crisis. How are we to think about this? Come up with conspiracy theories? Grumble? Fear and anxiety? Numb ourselves? Netflix binge? Watch news stations all day to build your anxiety? I want to give you God's answer this morning is what should we do in the midst of the coronavirus. Let's go to our God and let's pray and ask that he would meet every heart listening this morning. Father God, I come before you and we we need your answer for this. I don't want man's answer. I don't want cheap fixes. I want your remedy for how to think about life in a time like this. And so, God, I pray that you would meet us in your word and you would give us the the mind of Christ. Lord, give us the thought of of how to think the mind of Christ, the way he would think about this, the way you would want us to think about this as children of God. So, Father, I want to pray for any fear in any hearts this morning who've gathered in their rooms, their homes, wherever they would be. Just say, shh. Like those waves, God, and calm hearts. And just let the Word of God do what it does. Meet us in a very special way in a turbulent time. And calm the sea, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Philippians. Paul's locked up. My question is, are you discouraged, Paul? Your whole life is to preach the gospel and you're sitting in a prison cell. Are you scared, waiting to find out if your head's going to be cut off in the morning? 
Are you, are you depressed because your plans and everything you thought God was calling you to do are not working out? And as we open up this letter in verse 3 of chapter 1, I thank my God and all my remembrance of you, always offering prayer with joy in my every prayer for you all because of your koinonia that we share our participation in the gospel from the first day until now. Paul's not down. He's rejoicing and he's giving thanks to God for the saints in Philippi. Look at verse 12. I want you to know, brethren, <clears throat> that my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel, so that my imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become well known throughout, catch this word, the whole praetorian guard and to everyone else. The gospel is spreading right through Caesar's palace. It's going through the whole praetorian guard. They're hearing the gospel. So in verse 18, what then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, the gospel is being preached, that Christ is proclaimed. And in this I rejoice, and yes, I will rejoice. The gospel of Jesus Christ cannot be imprisoned. It's going forth, and I'm full of joy as I sit here in this prison cell. It spreads at times like this. You can lock us up, but this is the time that the great kingdom advance happens most often. This is when we really appear as lights in a world that is scared by the way that we think and act during times like this. This is an amazing opportunity for the church of God, for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Luther's imprisonment brought about a mighty fortress is our God. In a Bedford jail, the English received the pilgrim's progress. In Aberdeen's cell, we got the letters of Samuel Rutherford. In Paul and Rome in prison, we get the letter to the Philippians. I love how God uses quarantine with something beautiful come out of this. Amen? I heard one in the back, I think. I love it. Our sound team, our worship team, guys, I am not alone. Thank you, Lord. So, how can Paul be this way? Huh? Worship team? How can Paul be this way? If you're scared and you have anxiety, guess what? <laughs> I do too. When I quit looking at the remedy that I'm going to give you this morning, if I move away from it, I feel anxious. CNN makes me anxious. And I want to comfort every worried or scared saint this morning. I don't want to look down on that. I don't want to push it aside. I want to look at it and lift your eyes to look at Jesus Christ and find peace. And any unbeliever tuned in, this is what you're looking for. This is what the world will never be able to give you. Peace with God and peace in your heart during times like this and the threat of death. Here it is. If you've tuned in, this is what you're looking for. Paul's going to let us into the recesses of his heart, the depth of his thinking and his motivations, the place of peace, the place I want to live during this time, and the place that I want for every one of you this day, I want to remind you again of your blessed hope. Because what we see in here on a daily basis is not telling us truly how to think about this situation. The just shall live by faith. And that is what we're going to look at this morning. So if you'll look with me in verse 19 of Philippians chapter 1, Paul says, For I know <coughs> that this will turn out <coughs> for my deliverance. This is the trial awaiting the verdict of his sentence, sentencing. I know this will turn out then. And then in verse 20, according to my earnest expectation, this Greek word is only used twice in the Bible. It's used another time in Romans 8, 19. Creation is, is, is longing and looking for the redemption that's going to come when Jesus Christ returns. And it, it meant to stretch and lift your neck as far as it could look. And so he's saying, my, it was stretching my neck and causing me to look. And what I'm the most concerned about 
what, what my earnest expectation and hope is. What is it, Paul? That I shall not be put to shame in anything. That I would do nothing that dishonors Christ in this process, this trial, or this verdict that might say guilty. If Christ is not glorified in me, I'll be ashamed. My burden, what has me stressed during this time, is that I don't glorify Jesus Christ in my body. But that with all boldness, that Greek word means not to cower, not to shrink back, not to act to shame or take the edge off the message of the gospel. That's what has me, that I, with all boldness, that Christ shall even now, as always, be exalted in my body. Whether, this is called an instrumental in the Greek, <clears throat> whether by the instrument of life or the instrument of death. Here's Paul's passion. It's not just get me out of this prison. There's one thing that has my neck stretched and looking with hope. That Christ would be exalted in this body through the instrument, God, that you choose, whether it be life or death. And I want you to hear this. That means it doesn't matter which instrument you choose, God. Life or death, my greater concern is that whichever one you pick, Christ would be exalted in my body by the instrument. But what does matter is whatever one you pick, Christ. I want that name exalted, and if it is, I will rejoice because we're about to see why. Paul's body is a piece of meat. It's been stoned and just received the 40 lashes and he's been beaten. It's going to be dismembered at his death. And he just looks at that scarred body and he says it's for one thing. The only reason you gave me a body is for me to exalt Jesus Christ. What does that say to a nation that idolizes the body? The reason I have a body is to exalt Jesus Christ. And as I look at the sphere called life, just one thing that I want, and that's Christ exalted. As I wait for my verdict, there's just one concern in my heart. And as I look at my life, there's just one concern in whatever circumstances Christ be exalted. I don't want to be put to shame. With all boldness, I want to make Him known. Is that what is preoccupying your thoughts in these days? Oh, this is so realigning for what is our real hope and what is the hope of the gospel. That's to be the driving passion of our hearts. The name of Christ and whatever He chooses for me. First cough, first missed paycheck. How can I exalt Jesus Christ in my body? I wonder if we'd be sending prayer requests all around the world. Oh God, just let me be delivered from prison. All night fast, asking God, just get me out of here. The burden of Paul's heart is God, you, you pick whichever instrument, whichever one will give you the most glory. That's the burden of my heart. Oh God, make us men, women, and children like this. Please. How do you think like this? Well, now he's going to explain it further with my favorite passage in the whole Bible. It starts in verse 21 with four. That's not how you start a sentence. It's explanatory. So Paul's now going to explain and give us more definition what he means by that so we can be those kind of people. <clears throat> verse 21. For to me, to live is Christ, to die is gain. Paul just says there's two possible outcomes. I could have life, or I could have death. And let's look at each one and see how do we think about each one as children of God. And this is amazing to me. First, if I get life, if I get released, and more time to live, what am I going to do with it? 
There's, this isn't the end. What am I going to do with the rest of my life? And for Paul, it was just really simple. If I get life, it's Christ. <laughs> That's all it is. This verse was the very first verse I memorized as a, as a believer. Because it took my heart away right away. And I've spent three decades studying it, meditating on it, and seeking to have this mindset. How do I get that? And this week, it just exploded in my heart. A long time ago, in another life, I preached through Philippians. And, and I did a sermon on each one of these. For me to live is Christ. Another sermon, to die is gain. If, if you want to go back to that and get it on our website, I believe it's up there. We went through all of Paul's statements about how he viewed Christ to try to lay hold of what did he mean for me to live as Christ. <clears throat> and I think that's really profitable. But this week, I just narrowed it down into its context and into the letter, and I just found pure gold by doing that. And that's what I want to do this morning. So let's look at the immediate context. In verse 18, what then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in this, I will rejoice. So for Paul to live is the advancement of the gospel. If, if you give me life, it's Christ. It's to tell others about Christ. My coronavirus, my passion is to tell others about Christ. If they're scared. They need him. If you give me more life and spare me, I'm going to tell people about Christ. That's what it is for me to live. Give me more life, so I'll tell more about Christ. And then look in verse 22. But if I am to live on in the flesh, this is going to mean fruitful labor for me. And I don't know which one to choose, life or death. But verse 23, I'm hard pressed from both directions. Having the desire to depart and be with Christ for that is very much better. And I, and I said that's bad English and it's bad Greek. <laughs> Paul's just, that's very much better if I could go be with Christ. Oh, if I could depart and be with him. That's what I want. That's my chief end. That's my goal. That's my passion. But verse 24, yet to remain on in the flesh is more necessary for your sake, O church. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy and the faith, so that your proud confidence may abound in Christ Jesus through my coming to you again. Only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so whether I come to see you or remain absent, I will hear of you that you're standing firm in one spirit, with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. If I get to live, it's ministry and it's fruit. And the fruit, he said, uh, is that I want you to have progress and joy in your faith. I, I want you to see more of Christ and to have more joy in believing in who he is and what he's done and that to die is gain. And so if, if I'm going to stay, if I get more life, it's to help your faith and joy in Christ. That's what this is about. That's why I want to live, not so I can see my grandchildren and do all these other things. I want to live because I want Christ formed in people. Flip over to chapter 2. Verse 1, Therefore, if there's any encouragement in Christ, if there's any consolation of love, any fellowship of the Spirit, any affection and compassion, boy, did I feel all those this morning. Make my joy complete by being of the same mind, Maintaining the same love, united in spirit and intent on one purpose. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit. But with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Don't merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. If I get to live, my life for yours. I want to forget me and I want to love you. I don't think there's ever a better time right now than all of us forgetting ourselves and serving. And the things that I have been seeing have been overwhelming of how this church has been loving. I, I mean, simple things like a newborn baby that doesn't have wipies 
and, and one announcement, and I think we had 5,000 wipes ready to be distributed to, to moms who are going to need them as well. And those are small things, but to me, they're big. And, and if I get life, it's not how do I, am I going to spend it on me? How am I going to spend it for others? That's the way Paul thought. Chapter 3, verse 7, Paul just gave the, the hall of flesh. He listed all the things that he accomplished as a Pharisee and uh, to the law he was found blameless. And he says in verse 7, but whatever things were gain to me, those things I have counted as loss, that Greek word is manure, uh, I count them as manure for the sake of Christ. Everything I ever thought that was going to get me acceptance with God under the law and striving, I realize now it, it was manure. It was actually leading me away from God. It was loss. And it was leading me away from finding acceptance and favor by faith in what Christ has done. And so I count that them as loss for the sake of Christ. And more than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I've suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish so that I might gain Christ and may be found in him not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. And so I want you to, to see for Paul, I've learned to count everything else rubbish, except for the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. If I get life, it's Christ. That's all I want. Chapter 4, James read this last week. I'm going to begin in verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice, and I want to say that in the middle of what's going on in our country and in our lives right now, as this is a man in prison with much going on. And I want you to rejoice in the Lord, because he, He's where our joy and our hope is found, not in our circumstances. And this is a test like never before, where you can find your joy. What is your hope? Let your gentle spirit be known by all men, and I'm praying for that as a church during a time like this, that your, your gentle spirit, your forbearing spirit be known by all men. For the Lord is near, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God and the peace of God which surpasses all comprehension will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. If I get to live I'm going to put all my anxieties on Christ. I'm going to look to Him. I'm going to trust Him. I'm going to have peace because of the Prince of Peace. And so I'm just telling you right now, I want to be characterized by thanksgiving because everyone's grumbling. And you're going to be set apart as lights if we'll be the people who just give thanks to God because of everything that we have in Jesus Christ. And look with me in verse 10. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last you've revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned before, but you lacked opportunity. And not that I speak from want, for I've learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. I know how to get along with humble means, and that's coming. And I also know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, of having abundance and suffering needs, and I can do all things through him who strengthens me. <laughs> Put that verse in context. I can trust and be content in Christ, whether I have a lot or nothing or very little. So if I can live, I can be content in Christ who gives me everything that I need and he'll bring me through much and through abundance. And I can just be content in whatever he gives through Christ who will strengthen me right now to be content if I don't have a paycheck next week and I don't know where it's coming from, it's coming from Christ. And I'm gonna trust and I'm gonna be content. Whatever he brings into America's economy, I'm gonna be content 
in Christ. Thank you, brother. And then I want you to look at 419. And my God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. For me to live is Christ. My God will meet every need that I have in Jesus Christ. And so I don't want you to look to CNN. I want you to, I keep saying CNN, any news. Look to Jesus Christ. And he will supply all of your needs in a time like this. And man, is he ever. My life is hid with Christ. And if God gives me life to this coronavirus and everything else, it's not going to be I'm going to go to Disneyland and build bigger barns. But it's going to be Christ. Whatever days God gives you, they're for Christ. Who loved me and gave himself for me. Amen? Every day I have is spent for him. And if he gives me 10,000 more days, they're going to be spent for him. And if he gives me one more, it'll be spent for him. And if he gives me 10,000 tongues, it'll be spent in singing his praise. For me to live is Christ. And to die is gain. I can't even begin to tell you what that phrase means to me. To die is our hope. To die is not the, not the end. <laughs> the finish line of the, the reward for all of eternity. To die as I'm, I'm finished. I ran my race. And now there's stored the crown of righteousness for me to be with Christ forever. Guys, the, the coronavirus is, is my friend. <laughs> to die is gain. To die is gain. How do I glorify Christ in death. That's what Paul is wanting to do in our context. And he wants to die because he gets more of Christ. Hallelujah. That's the, that's the end. That's the beauty. But I see something more going on in this text that I've missed for decades. Because no one sees that on earth. He, he dies. He gets gain. Hallelujah for Paul. That's the best. But we sit here, I don't get to see any of that. I can't see past the veil of life. How does that glorify God? How do I glorify God, Christ, in my body by death? And the gain, this is what I think. By life, there's nothing that I want more than Christ on this earth. Everything else is manure compared to Christ. And so I just want him more than anything else on this earth. And to die, there's nothing that I leave here that I want more than Jesus Christ. There's nothing that I got to keep holding to and clinging to that's not better than Jesus Christ. I'm going to let go of my kids. I love them. But the gain is I get to go to something better than anything I've ever had here on this earth. The best thing I've ever tasted on this earth is Jesus Christ in a shadow, in a mirror dimly. And to die is gain. There's nothing here. There's some good things here. But they, they grow strangely dim in the light of His beauty and grace. So I'm not clutching and grasping my life, and my possessions, and my comfort, and my family, for this is very much better to be with Jesus Christ. The coronavirus, in a worst case scenario, can be the instrument that brings me ultimately to Jesus Christ to get this gain that I'm longing for. Christ no more by faith, but by sight. No more worshiping him with remaining flesh, but perfectly without sin to disrupt it forever. 
unhindered, perfect oneness for all of eternity. Don't hold to the shadows. Embrace the fullness of the, of the gain that Paul is talking about in our text. Coronavirus, do your worst. <laughs> Stare in the eyes the worst case scenario and it's, it's death. For you, brother and sister, it is gain. And I want that to take away every fear and every anxiety and I want you just to stare at Jesus Christ and say, you're the finish line and I want it. I want it. It's better than anything I have here on this earth. So I conclude. I just want to exalt Christ in my body. And if he gives me life, it's Christ. I just want nothing more than him. And if I die, it's gain. I don't want to hold on to anything here. I just want him. For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. Unbeliever. To die is horrendous. You better be scared of this coronavirus. You should be up every night worrying and fearful. Because if you catch it and you die and you stand before this God, in your own goodness, and your own righteousness, it's going to become a filthy rag before this majestic, holy God. And you're going to hate that you rejected the Lord Jesus Christ every day you breathed and walked on this earth. And so I'm crying to you. I, I want your death to be gain. And I, there's only one way it can ever be gain, and it's what will you do with Jesus Christ. If you reject him, to die is horrific. And if you receive him right now by faith that he went up on a cross and he stood in the epicenter of the wrath of God for your sins and he drained every last drop of the wrath that you deserved so now you could be forgiven for every iniquity that you have ever done and be reconciled to God and have peace with him. And he will give you this by faith not by your works, cleaning yourself up, fixing yourself, sitting there right now in fear as a sinner and crying out to God, all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And Jesus says, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest for your souls. Come to Jesus this very second and believe upon him. And I'll close with my dear saints at Southside. Man, I love you. My first thought I want to share with you is the government. Sorry, let's clear this up. They're appointed by God. They're appointed by God to rule and to protect, to bear the sword. And this currently, it's not persecution. You aren't here this morning because they're stomping out Christianity. But it's protection, and they have that authority by God to ask this of their citizens. And so we submit to God. And I want you to hear this with joy. I don't want grumbling. I want joy that we submit to God joyfully and wholeheartedly, and we do what they're asked. And when this is safe again, we will gather together to worship our God and thank him for a country that allows us to worship him in such freedom. And I thank you for all who have protected and fought for these freedoms because they mean more to me now than ever. Second, Paul in prison, he's quarantined by the most joyful letter he ever wrote. How you doing? <laughs> Do you know how to be still and know that he's God? 
This quarantine is a gift to get alone with your God and seek His face and commune and draw near to Him like never before. This is a gift for that. Thirdly, the gospel spreading, spreading under such turbulent times. I've had some beautiful conversations with people full of fear. I went to the whole praetorium guard because of it. I want you to redeem this like never before. I got to read you this little thing. I have a guy named Jacob Matthews. Jacob was going to this gathering with a bunch of kids his age. And because he's not ashamed of the gospel, he got on the computer. His mom says he never does this kind of stuff. And he wrote out the Romans road and he took this little sheet and he handed it out to every kid there ready to be mocked, ridiculed for the sake of the gospel. And I'm just crying that more than ever, don't be ashamed of this gospel and keep your eyes, hearts, minds, and ears open to it. Fourthly, one anothering. I'm so blessed by the way you're loving one another and thinking about each other. And I, I just want to excel still more that all the world will look and know that we're his disciples because we have love for one another. The world's alone right now and we are still so unified in one and praying and sharing and bringing meals and th this is the time more than ever to love like no other. Finances. I know IRAs have been hit hard and there's going to be many trials. Some have lost jobs already and cannot pay bills. And so we're calling for deep sacrifice to help each other through this. I want you to, I want First John to look it in the face. If you have this world's goods and possessions and see your brother in need and close your heart, he says, how can the love of Christ dwell in you? The, this is a time to be open-handed and large-hearted like our God. And we help each other get through this. this. This is it, the church being the church. And we're going to get each other uh, through this as the hands and feet of Christ. Sixthly, there's a lot of shattered Dreams, my heart breaks for people calling off weddings, graduations, their senior years. Uh, it's, it's hard. But Piper, I love his quote. He said, I want you to look at the life that you have dreamed and hoped for. And I want you to weep your eyes out. And then dry your eyes and live the life that God has called you to. And there's a sobering, narrowing reality of what is this life really about? And I, I want you to take those shattered dreams and hurt and weep, but I don't want you to live there. And I want you to say, okay, God, this is the life that you have decreed for me. Show me how to redeem it for your glory to exalt you with this body. Greatest cry, number seven, for all of us. I want you to look at this without fear and just be burdened. How do I glorify God during this time? I want you to be more concerned about that than the, what's causing you anxiety. And I want you to, to be burdened about, oh God, use me for your glory. How can I use this body that you've given to me for the glory and name of Jesus Christ? And then number eight. Hebrews says that as unbelievers, we were held by the captivity of the fear of death all of our days. And Jesus went into that death and he broke its jaws. He conquered it and he defeated it. And I close my sermon that there's an empty tomb. And if we believe in him, we shall live even if we die. So we're going to close in prayer. And then I've asked Jordan and Josh and the worship team or Thomas to come. And this song is just my heart with everything we just looked at. So I want you to just as a Whoever you're with, by yourself, with a family, I, I just want you now to worship with me uh, with, with what I just preached on. So let's go to our God and thank Him. God, thank You for this morning. Thank You for Your presence. Thank You for this passage. Thank You for Paul. Thank You for what You've taught us. And now by Your Holy Spirit, would You apply it to each heart? God, let, let no one just get this with their mind this morning, but let them understand it and fill their affections and their will with this truth. God, I want every saint at Southside Bible Church to declare for me to live as Christ and to die as gain. 
melt away all anxiety this morning as we stare into the face of Jesus Christ where safety and peace and all hope lies. God, I thank you for Christ. And it's in his beautiful, precious, holy name that we do pray. Amen.